Our scripture this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we could ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One thing about the season that we're in, a lot of us get to slow down a little bit and maybe notice some things that we haven't in a while. And one thing that's become a little clearer to me is that words are like little children. Uh, Words are always moving. They're never sitting still. For example, 1675, in London, nine years after the great fire swept through so much of the city, Sir Christopher Wren, the great um, architect, he was commissioned to um, rebuild St. Paul's Cathedral. And I know some of you out there I have been to St. Paul's. I've had a chance to actually worship there twice. It's a beautiful edifice. So Sir Christopher spent 35 years and gave the best of his genius to the project, but now it's been completed. He's an old man, but, but he's active enough that he can accompany the monarch, Queen Anne, as she goes in her initial tour of the building. She walks through it, looks around, says nothing. And then in typical British terseness, she responds with three adjectives. She said, it is artificial, it is amusing, it is awful. Now think about this, you're Sir Christopher Wren, this has been the magnum opus of your life, you've been waiting with bated breath to see what she would say. However, Wren's biographer said at this point, he breathed a sigh of relief, he fell to his knees and thanked Queen Anne for her graciousness. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, okay. Do you think he'd become hard of hearing? Do you think he was a little mentally addled? No. This is all about words not sitting still because you see in 1716, the word artificial meant artistic. The word amusing meant amazing. The word awful meant awe-inspiring. See, the words like little children, they just keep changing. And what happened to those words, um, artificial, amusing, and um, awful has happened to another word in our vocabulary. It's the word amateur, okay? Now in our parlance today, an amateur is a bungler, um, lacking in capacities, um, not professional. You sure you want to hire him? He's nothing but a rank amateur. Are you going to watch Dancing with the Stars tonight? No, no, I, I just don't want to see another amateurist display of the salsa. However, originally, that's not what the word amateur was about. You see, it's rooted in that Latin word amor, meaning to love. Originally, this is what amateur meant. Someone who is in it for the sheer love of it, okay? Um, The the motivation is not without, it's within. Uh, An amateur doesn't have to be paid to do something or externally coerced. And now a lot of you remember the, for generations, the Olympic ideal that all the performers were to be pure amateurs. Some of you remember Jim Thorpe, the great Native American athlete, decathlete, and who won several medals. And he had them all stripped away. Why? Because they found out that he had received $35 in a semi-pro baseball game. Now, a lot of times the Olympic ideal was accompanied by hypocrisy, but the ideal was there. People that are in it for the pure passion and joy and love of it. 
Do you know any amateurs? Do you know any amateurs? Okay, yeah. Um, John Freeman, for a number of years, was an adjunct professor in practical theology at Emory. And, and he wrote this piece when he talked about playing um, in a golf foursome at Druid Hills Golf Club. Now, a lot of times, you know, those of you that play golf, you'll end up with people that you know. But then there was a fo the fourth person was just a stranger to the other three of them. But as they're sitting there um, doing a little practice putting before the round opens, John looked in the guy's golf bag and could tell this guy was good. Why? Because he looked at his wedges and, and, and the grooves were almost worn out. And he, says, he knew this guy spends a lot of time on the links. And that was, that was what happened. They, they got out there and the stranger to them, he just hit these um, booming drives and these radar like iron shots. And you know, he had both a draw and a fade to his game. And so they get turning after the front nine and John Freeman turns to him and said, wow, what a display of golf. You know, have you ever thought about turning pro? And, and the fellow said, well, now, I did play four years in college, and after college, I tried to get my PGA card, never quite got there, but I did play nine years on one of the satellite tours and actually won a little bit of money and did all right. But he said, it's interesting you would ask me about turning pro because this is what I've been doing over the last two years. He said, what's that? He said, I've been trying to regain my amateur status. Now, I want to repeat that phrase. I'm trying to regain my amateur status. Well, the guy goes on and he didn't talk about injury. He didn't talk about um, kind of losing his, his putting stroke. He said, this is what happened. One day I realized um, this game that I once really loved uh, was now a job. And I knew the only way to recover the love was to get off the tour. Now, is there anything in any of this for us? I think so. I think so. I want to suggest this morning that we are at our best at Christ as Christians, at our very best, at our core, when we're in it for the sheer love and, and the joy of it. Uh, we're at our best when we're putting our feet on this path, not because somebody's convinced us it's the respectable thing to do or there'll be some tangible reward for us, but because we've been swept up in something that's so full of life we cannot help but be a part of it, to be an amateur. Now, I don't want to suggest this morning that you're going to find the word amateur in the book of Ephesians. It's not there in English. It's not there in the French translation. It's not there in the Greek. But I think you'll find it here in the spirit of what Paul is talking about. He's trying to take us back to being in, a, in it for the sheer love of it. Uh, Paul's so honest. You know, he's always going to tell us kind of his moods, his feelings, where he's at. And when he gets to this third chapter, he, sa he, he lets us know. He says, now look, right now, I'm not engaging in some kind of philosophical discussion. This is going to be a prayer. You know, you can use, he's almost like saying, you can use this in worship. I'm on bended need. This is what I'm praying for you. And I'm praying that the very Spirit of God would be within you and give you strength, not brute strength, but the kind of strength that works from the inside out. I'm praying that you will not just dabble in, but you will engage in the full dimensions of God's love. You'll ascend the heights, you'll plumb the depths, you'll explore the breadth of it. I want you to hear Paul's language here. He's talking about being rooted, grounded in love. This is not the pedantic language of a teaching that's to be mastered, a set of dictums that are to be rehearsed and memorized. This is about a relational life that becomes so much a part of us. Well, we're in it for the sheer joy of it. Now here's a question. Do you think you can start there? You know, being a true Christian amateur, and can you lose it? I, I think so. I think so. I think about people that do what I do. You know, I'm, I'm called a minister, but you might also say I'm called a religious professional. And, well, this can be an occupational hazard for us. You know, you know it often starts with these wonderful stirrings in the heart, stirrings of a call and devotion, but then 
Somewhere along the line, something just slips, slips, slips away. The vocation becomes an occupation. And what once was the stirring of the heart is now just a concern for competency or livelihood or status. Oh, yeah, the preacher still preaches, but all he does is boil water and never really makes soup anymore. (laughs) How did it go? They say that if you sell your heart, it's pretty hard to buy it back again. I had a mentor friend in ministry, he used to say something like this. He said, you know, you can pay us to um, proofread the bulletin and to stack the chairs, um, to attend the meetings, to deal with the conference bureaucracy, but you cannot pay us to love God or to love them. So we do that for free. I think that's true as long as we're still an amateur. Paul, though, isn't just writing about my type, religious professionals. This is to the church. It's to all of us. Do you think it can happen in the church? Who's he writing to here? Now, at this point in Paul's career, he's farther into this life of the church. They first thought it was going to be the parousia, parousia, the imminent second coming of Christ. But now they're settled in. They've been there a while. And if you know the story of the people at Ephesus, well, this church is now, you know, they have some structure to it. They probably have a couple of buildings. There's a hallway with the pictures of the former teachers and the former preachers. And um, their little graveyard out back where the saints are buried, it's, it's, it's getting larger and larger. They've been at it a while. And I wonder if Paul is saying, be careful, don't let something slip slip, slip away. What was once a relational adventure now just becomes kind of obligatory faith. Um, You you know, in obligatory faith, the, the poetry of faith is reduced to the prose of a how-to manual. In in obligatory faith, there's a lot of, um, keeping good books. You're always comparing. You're always calculating. Well, how am I doing compared to him? Has anybody noticed what I'm doing? And it runs hot and cold depending on what kind of return we're getting. If you feel yourself moving in that direction, just let it be like a warning signal. You're getting ready maybe to lose your amateur status. But but I want us to grasp this morning that losing that status isn't just about losing passion and joy. I think there's a loss of our efficacy. Our giving, our serving, our loving becomes something less than it should be. Beware. Beware even in the area of love. That can become less. Beware of a duty-filled Christian who has a gift in his or her hand because sometimes that gift can hurt more than it can help. I think it was Edgar Masters who said, some people um, poison their benefactions by their constant reminders of what they have done or they are doing for you. I took you in. You do remember that, don't you? I gave you my best, I'm giving you my best, and I'm going to be here to remind you. Yak, yak, yak. The benefactions are spoiled. But now turn it around. Turn it around. There's nothing better to be served and to be loved by a true amateur Christian, somebody who doesn't need to remind you what they've done for you, somebody who doesn't need to even know, have you know that they have done something for you. I I love our Mennonite Christian brothers and sisters, many of them in the Western Pennsylvania area, and they have this wonderful sense of how to be kind and gracious and the offering of a gift. And they say, whenever you can, just do it as subtly as you can. Even have the joy of just letting the other person discover it without you being there. Let me give you an example. Granddad, some of you, I used to have a Barlow knife, and he had this yellow-handled Barlow knife. He'd had it since he was a boy, and now, you know, 70 years or so later, he's lost that Barlow knife, and the family knows about it. 
Well, the Mennonites would say, don't, don't run down to the hardware store and pick one up. And then one day at lunch, you throw it on the table and say, here, this is for you. No. So this is what you do. When granddad's out in the field, you know he's not going to be in the house. You slip into his bedroom. and You know the coat that he's going to be wearing on Sunday morning. And you just slipped up Barlow into the coat pocket. And granddad's going to walk into church on Sunday morning. And his hand's going to go down into the pocket. And he's going to say, great day, great goodness. Somebody must really love me. Look at this. A brand new yellow-handled Barlow knife. That's what it means to be loved by a Christian amateur. You know. uh, they don't have to prove anything. They don't have to hold anything over your head. They're, they're just in it because they can't do otherwise. Maybe that's what our golfer was missing. Think about that. Week after week, you know, he went to all these carefully prescribed and detailed tournaments, and at every hole there was a, uh, a rule keeper, and every day out there he had the scorecard and the pencil, having to count every stroke and missed stroke. And maybe he missed those days when he used to be coming home from work, and he would go by the municipal course, and he could just hear the call of the farewell. <laughs> and he would hear this voice say, Self, you got about 45 good minutes of light left. And he just pulls the car off to the side and he opens the trunk. He doesn't get out the whole bag. He gets three clubs, maybe two balls and a tee. And he doesn't even bother with a scorecard or a pencil. He just goes out there and has at it. Okay. Now just carry that spirit into the life of faith. Carry that spirit into the spirit of love. And that's going to take our loving beyond the bounds of prudence and practicality. It's going to take it out into the, the wide open space of um, spontaneity and extravagance. You're grounded and rooted in love and you're just looking for that which is willing and ready to receive. Now, if you feel like you've been slipping away from your amateur status as a Christian, don't, don't go out and think you have to buy a how-to manual on how to be an amateur. Do like Paul's saying, just go back to where it starts, grounded, rooted in the love of God. And I want to say something right now, I'm going to be careful, because you might think that I'm sliding the, uh, the idea of God. But I would suggest this morning that God is the great amateur. Now listen, li listen to what I'm saying. Take this into Genesis 1. Here is God, also known as holy generosity, getting ready to act. And, and, and every option is available and open to God. And what does God do? God gives and God creates. And there's nothing in this account that suggests to me there's any ulterior motive. It's not God trying to prove something or get something. There is no coercion at work. Out of the joy of God's aliveness, God just lovingly, willingly widens the circle of joy. And once God starts, God cannot stop. And when the creation becomes old and damaged, God reaches deeper than God had ever reached before and offers his son, the new creation. And the son comes among us and pours out his life and his love without looking back, without counting the cost. God, the, the great amateur. And Paul said, we are made in that image. Come back to that. It will change your life and you will become a lover of God and all that God loves. Well, I'm going to close with this story. It's a true story and it has an interesting little twist to it. It begins as a story of some pain because it's about this woman who's, well, her husband is um, a bitter a man. Uh, his tones are usually harsh and demanding. He's always telling her what she needs to change, what she must do, a lot of ought and must. And 
In fact, he gets to the point that every day he, he gets out this little piece of paper and he writes on that the things that she's supposed to do during the day and he posts it there on the refrigerator. And he comes home at the end of the day to check on the list and the best she can ever get is just a little grunt, a little nod of approval. The woman came to hate the list and she came to disdain him. Sadly for him, he didn't get to change the sampling of his life. He died in his mid-40s. Five years later, she remarries. And this time, it's, it's different. Her relationship with her new husband, it's, it's filled with grace. It's filled with mutuality. Um, they have a good time together. She feels like every day they're moving to something more, to something better. But now it's spring house cleaning, and they, they had committed themselves to going through the basement, going through the attic, and getting rid of some of the old things. She finds this old box up in the attic, and she pulls off the lid of the box. She looks down, and right on top there says, somewhat crumpled piece of paper is folded over, and she... She picks it up, and you know what that paper was? It was one of those lists that had been on the refrigerator. She didn't know why she kept it, but she did, and here it is. And she starts reading the list, and um, something surprisingly transpires in her mind and heart. She's reading the list, and she's saying to herself, my goodness, I'm doing so many of these things every day with my husband and for my husband and no one's asked me to do them. No one has coerced me. Kind of interesting, isn't it? What had become naked drudgery now had been clothed in love and transformed into joy. What did they say? Duty can make you do things well. Love can make you do them beautifully. I don't know, maybe this is a good place to stop. The story of a woman so in love that obligation is besides the point. Paul says, listen friends, don't let it slip, slip, slip away. I want you to come back. Come back to where all is rooted and grounded in the love of God. And if we'll do that, maybe we'll be wise enough to proudly say, yes, I'm an amateur, a rank amateur, a pure lover of God and all that God loves. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.